We, well, we would take into consideration their risk for other diseases. So if they are high risk for oral cancer, we wouldn't reduce the amount of x-rays we would take unless they were like, had no like risk for perio or caries. However, if they're high risk for oral cancer, chances are they're high risk for um, perio because a lot of those things overlap. Not, not always, but there are a lot of things that overlap in that. So we, we would want to take the x-ray so that we can um, see how their uh, stability for the perio disease is, but we would still um, you know, be as prudent as we possibly could be, uh, but we wouldn't not take x-rays just because let's say they smoke and drink alcohol. So that's like two things combined tend to increase your risk for oral cancer. We wouldn't take less x-rays on them just because of that, um, because the dose is so low and they're probably at a high risk for perio. So we, one, you know, and I don't think anybody would probably say that the dental radiographs would, would increase their likelihood of getting oral cancer just because it is such a low dose and it's so spread apart. Although that's a good thing to think about, it is the kind of thing that patients think about sometimes too. So it's not a bad idea to keep that kind of thing in mind so that you can talk to your patient about it. Um, next slide. So radiation biologists divide human tissue into two categories. There's a little bit more detail in your textbook than this, but don't worry about the little bit more detail that the um, textbook goes into. Um, we're just going to deal with somatic and genetic. Those are the main kind of tissue categories that we're going to deal with and that you're going to be tested on. Somatic tissue is um, when you have an effect, a somatic effect, or it's affecting somatic tissue, it's tissue that is in your body now being affected by the radiation. So you can think of this in terms of somebody getting a lot of radiation and then end up um, getting like leukemia, or let's say their salivary glands are affected um, and they don't, now they have dry mouth, xerostomia. So it's something that is a, causing an effect in that person because of the radiation they had now, genetic is something where the, the patient may not have any effects at all. They might not notice anything negative, but the radiation has affected their reproductive um, cells and the next generation could be affected and have damage to those cells causing the next generation to have some kind of a negative effect. So somatic is only affects the individual. Tissue are not inherited from generation to generation. You don't get your dad's uh, you know, specific epithelial cells, you get genetic material, but you don't get his cells. And then, but with genetic, you're going to, the, um, whatever that genetic DNA material in the eggs, the sperm that can be damaged and passed on to future generations. So there is a good slide here and it's considered more serious when it's genetic because you you know, you, your body might be able to repair and heal, but you don't want to damage your potential for all your kids to have a problem. I mean, that's just would be not good at all. But here's an image that kind of um, shows it visually. You have this um, cute little pupper is getting radiated. And um, if it's genetic, this, the dog's fine, but the offspring is not feeling so hot. If it's somatic, they're not feeling so hot, but future generations are okay. It could be both. Yeah. Like if the radiation affects the reproductive and some other body part, yeah, you probably could. Some people get like when they get radiation, they get uh, like a, their skin gets real sensitive and red. So that, you know, and if it's close to genetic material, then that, then you could probably see both effects. Like you could see the effect to you and then you could, and then there could also be some genetic um, damage as well. Uh, okay, so animals exposed to radiation, to somatic tissue, they don't produce visible changes to tissue until a certain threshold dose is met. So there's two different kinds of um, ways to think about this. One is called linear, which will be on the next slide, and this is the threshold dose. So what this means is you go in for radiation, 
And let's say your total, I don't know how much radiation they give people for different procedures. So I'm totally just making this up, but let's say they're going to give you, you know, 0.5, whatever, microsieverts. And, and they, they give you half of that. And then they give you the next half, like the next day, but you might not actually see those you're not gonna see those negative effects until they reach that threshold dose, that negative threshold dose of you know, half a microsievert or whatever it is. So you're, it's kind of a good example of this to think about it is like when you go out in the sun and if you're the kind of person that's lucky enough to tan, I just freckle, then you lay out there and you're getting a really nice tan and you're getting browner and browner and it's just looking really good. And then all of a sudden you fall asleep and now you're, you're burned. Your nice tan turned into a burn. So that was a threshold uh, dose. You were, you were good up until a point, and now you're burned. Now you have sun damage. So that's kind of a good way to think about it. Examples of this are patients who end up losing their hair. You know, a smaller dose might not do it, but once they get to a certain point, that's when the damage to the follicles happens and they lose their hair or um, skin reddening or um, cataract formation if the radiation is uh, close to the eyes. So a threshold dose has to be hit before uh, those negative effects. When we're talking about genetic tissue, however, there is not the luxury of being able to get a certain amount of radiation in before damage occurs. It's linear, so and it's more equivalent. So the amount of radiation that you get is goes up with the amount, the amount of damage that you get goes up with the amount of radiation that you get. So it's linear, they kind of go, and there's a graph that will show this to you uh, so you can see visually. But um, mutation changes in the information contained by the chromosomes in the sperm and the egg. Mutation have the ability to produce children with a higher likelihood of developing birth defects and cancer such as leukemia. So mutation follows a non-threshold or linear type of dose response where somatic follows a threshold dose. But here you can see this in a little bit more of a visual here. We have this linear. So once the dose starts, your dose is along, is this the X? Forget that. That's the X-axis. So your dose is along the X-axis and it will X, it'll just keep rising the minute you start giving that dose, your damage starts going up. Whereas with the somatic tissue, the damage doesn't start until you get about here and then it'll start going up. And there was another, there was a, another like little animation that was supposed to come in for this and I don't know how to make it do it. Oh, there it is. So somatic tissue. So um, this slide is showing the result of disease, the disease that you can get with the critical organ that's being radiated. So if you, if radiation is hitting the lens of the eye, the patient is, uh, could get cataracts. If it's hitting the rep reproductive cells, there's going to be genetic mutation. If it's a fetus, there could be a congenital defect. Um, if it's bone marrow, that's going to affect the white blood cell production, they can get leukemia. If it's thyroid, they could get thyroid cancer. And if it's skin, they could have an increased risk for skin cancer. So we wanna keep radiation really low. So what's our biggest, what's one of our biggest concerns with dental, dental x-rays? Thyroid, yeah. So we wanna make sure that that thyroid is nice and covered. It's tricky because some patients have like maybe a shorter neck or something. And so sometimes when we get the thyroid or just a larger circumference neck too. So sometimes when we try and get that thyroid collar around them, it's like it rides up or something. You know, it's like, it's almost in our way. So you can kind of tuck it down under their chin, but you always want to make sure that that thyroid collar, collar is around their neck. The rest of it doesn't even really matter. It's, we don't even have to have patients wear thought, lead aprons anymore. Did you guys realize that? They don't even have to wear them. It's, they do have to wear a thyroid collar. That, that they still have it. But to, to actually explain to a patient that you don't actually need this, 
when they're so used to having it, it just takes more time to explain to every patient that they don't need this live apron anymore. And, and so that's why we continue to do it. So we will continue to do it in our clinic. And chances are, when you go out into the world, many, many offices still use them. I have heard of some that have done away with it and they maybe taken the time to educate their patients on it and their patients feel comfortable. Um, okay, so um, these are some of the critical organs in dentistry. And that's because these are, these are areas that might be affected from just a dental x-ray. So thyroid gland for sure is the number one, because that's going to be the most. Bone marrow in any of the bones in our head and neck, um, I'm sure not nearly as likely to be affected um, because of the low dose, but that's in our critical organ list. Um, the skin, obviously, any on the skin in the face and the neck. And then the lens of the eye, we want to make sure that the, when we direct Sometimes it'll, it, this will throw you guys when you're taking your um, anterior PA films, because sometimes you're going to be very directed, like kind of like this. And you're like, am I shooting them in the eyeball with the radiation? It kind of can make you feel a little bit nervous. Um, but really, it's more like you just, you just don't want that BID to be coming straight into their eye. If it's at a sharp angle, it's going to really be going past their eye. Um, but it's, it's not going like right in, but we do want to, we do want to consider the angle of the BID and the central ray with things like the eye, because that is a sensitive, um, radio sensitive um, area. So remember those four on exam, those are going to be um, critical organs that you need to know for the future. So radiation measurements and units. So we have the exposure. This can get a little bit confusing as we talk about the, the dosing and the measurements, um, but we'll, it'll be okay. We'll get through this. So the exposure is the amount of radiation that comes out of the x-ray unit and reaches the person. And not all, of the, not all of what they're exposed to actually gets absorbed. Some of it, if you guys remember from what happens with the x-ray photons, some of it passes right through them. Um, and doesn't actually absorb into them at all. So there, you know, it's not 100% of it is, they're not gonna absorb 100% of what comes out of the x-ray machine, but they will absorb probably most of it. Then there's the dose, which is the amount of radiation deposited into the tissue. That's what is being counted as what actually gets absorbed into their tissue. And then the amount that's actually um, absorbed or the amount of radiation deposited into the tissue and the amount that is actually absorbed is the dose. The dose equivalent is a concept that allows comparison of the biological effect of different types of ionizing radiation. So when they, when they think about all the different dosing of all the different types of radiation, they are trying to understand how much of all of it is, is too much or, or how much is enough, you know, how much until we see these negative effects. So they're trying to understand and compare the, the different types of radiation. So the dose equivalent measurement is used to compare the biological effects of the different types of radiation. The traditional unit down here, the traditional unit is the REM or the Renkin equivalent in man. You guys remember, why would it be called Renkin? Yeah, the guy, <laughs> it's the guy. Yeah, so but this is the old, this is the old system. So we don't really talk about RADs and REMS anymore. We, they talk about it more just like that video that we watched. They talked about Siebert. So we talk about Siebert. So there's a lot of information on this slide. You do not need to memorize it. But what I do want you to take away is a couple things. One, if you notice here, well, I don't know that this slide is going to show. might be the next. Just gonna go back one really quick. No, I think it's in a couple slides. Okay, so a couple things to notice here is that when we're talking about the doses that, that we get, 
we're talking about not just a rad or a sievert, but we're talking about micro and millisievert. So it's, it's like tiny, it's like fractions of a sievert. And the average yearly exposure from what the textbook said, the, the video said six, but the textbook says our average yearly exposure just walking around and living life is about three um, micro sieverts or millisieverts, sorry, millisieverts here. So that's your average yearly exposure. So here, this will all, you can look back at this um, slide when, when we go through the other slides here and you can just kind of see a little bit of the conversion. I had a whole conversion um, slide and I took it out because I thought it's just gonna muddle up what you need to know. I'm not gonna test you, you don't have to convert. Um, so I just took it out because I just thought it's just too much. But what you do need to see is and understand from the old version of the rads and the rems to the sieverts is that um, grays and sieverts are a hundred times bigger than rads and rems. So the sievert system, you're not, it's not apples to apples. The sievert system it are larger than a rad or a rem. So in one sievert is a hundred rem. So one rem is 0.1 sievert and so forth. So a gray and a sievert are larger than a rad and a rem. So just star that. Here's a great slide. This is going to be something that you'll want to really kind of absorb because this will help you a lot when you're talking to your patients. If you look over here, this is all in micro sieverts micro sieverts. And so one bite wing used with a rectangle collimator is two micro sieverts. A complete series with a rectangle collimator is 35 micro sieverts. Um, a full mouth series with a round collimator can be up to 171 micro sieverts. So see, it's, it's like less than half, or it's about, you know, well, this is less than 50%, but and the, typically they say the rectangle is 50% or 60, 50 to 60% less radiation than the round. So we're talking less than 200 microsieverts and the average person walking around um, without doing anything, just living life gets about 3000 microsieverts, which converts to those three uh, millisieverts. I am yeah, I'm always afraid I'm saying that I'm getting those mixed up. But so, you know, one set of x-rays. So you get a FMX three to five years. So once every three to five years, you get exposed to less than 200 um, microsieverts out of the 300 or 3,000 that you get just simply walking around outside, riding on airplanes, things like that. Yeah. We will discuss that because some, some of you, especially if you've been in an office, you may have encountered that there is no, there is no real thought about the risk factor. It's just like your due. The insurance will pay for it and your due. So that happens a lot. And you will encounter that and you may have already encountered that. We just teach you something different here. And then when you get out, you have to sort of adapt to the world, you can educate your doctor, you, but you know, it does oftentimes come down to insurance pays for it and you're due. But not every dentist is like that. A lot of dentists will, you know, they'll say, yeah, you, she's not, she's low risk and, and she's not, we could wait another year. But you, that will be something that as healthcare providers you'll encounter and then you have to figure out how to handle that on you know that situation because that does come up a, a lot, and I'm sure um, those of you who have who have worked for dentists you you can attest to that. So anyway, so this just shows you how small it really is a drop in the bucket um, with how much radiation. So patients when they come in and they are worried about the X-rays, you know it's just not a bad idea to like laminate this and. Put it, you know, make a card and bring it with you to your operatory. And then you, if you're 
dentist doesn't have one. And there's other things you could probably find online. So um, some of these slides are, feel. I wish I had converted them all to the same because it, I feel like going between milli and micro gets confusing. But um, uh, somebody who deals with radiation on a regular basis, they might have an average of over a five-year period. So I broke it down to four um, millisieverts I can't even remember if that's micro or milli. Milli, yeah, thank you. So th that breaks it down to four millisieverts per year on average. And um, the textbook says three is what is uh, for somebody who is just regular, doesn't work with radiation. So you might possibly get one more millisievert than the general population. So we, bi we build off of this, this um, system called ALARA, which is as low as reasonably um, allowable, as low as reasonably allowable, ALARA. And this is important for you to know this phrase and what it, what it, it, what it refers to. So what it means is we only take the x-rays that we have to take. And then we want it to be based off of our patient's history and their risk. The ri Once we do a risk assessment, we wanna base those x-rays that we take off of those two things. We wanna take them well the first time, so we don't have to take a bunch of retakes. And then um, we would like to do things to reduce their radiation, like you know these precautions that we take with the collimator and the rectangular BID and you know, all these other things. But the biggest, the main two things is take, try and take a good x-ray the first time, minimize the amount of retakes, and then um, really take your patient's individual situation into consideration. Um, so what do we do to protect the patient? So this is important for you guys to know. It's an obscured slide, but this is, every slide has important information, unless I tell you otherwise, like the Millie Sievert slide. Um, but film speed, when you're taking traditional films, D is the faster, it, um, it needs less radiation to get a picture on, the, on the, the film. So D speed is faster than B speed or A speed. So there's like A, B, C, D. Um, there, oh, I'm sorry, F is the fastest. That's why I like the F because F is easy to remember because F for fast. So there's A, B, C, D, E, F, and then F is faster than D. So the higher the number, the higher the letter, the faster. Um, so just remember that as well for an exam question. Digital films, once we, do, once we started getting into digital, we were able to really do use less radiation on patients. It makes a really big difference. So digital is lower than traditional. And then the kilovoltage range, we want to have a high enough kilovoltage range so that we are taking diagnostic films. Most of our units are set at 65, except for that one 260 four unit, that room number, that can be set at 65 or 70. But um, basically you want your KVP to be somewhere between 60 and 70. And then that filtration, that aluminum filtration that is in the unit, that is required by law to also um, weed out the non-necessary um, radiation. Collimate the beam. Rectangle is better than round, but you'll probably only see round out in the real world, but it is less radiation. Long cones are better than short cones. So these are all different um, ways of protecting the patient. Here's that same slide that talks, that shows how the radiation is less for a rectangular beam. We use XCPs to minimize errors to make an, hopefully take a, a, a parallel technique X-ray with, with the XCP so that we eliminate errors and distortion and cone cutting. Um, so if we can utilize the XCPs, that has helped improve people's um, X-rays. Lead apron, we know that really the bigger part of the lead apron is not super important, but the thyroid collar for sure is. And if you happen to be taking um, X-rays that were traditional, you would really want to make sure that you know how to uh, process them in a correct way so that you don't take a beautiful x-ray and then ruin it in the processing um, stage where you actually have to put it um, in the machine and it runs through the fixer and the developer. 
We will talk briefly about that next week. And I'll, I have some, um, I have a handout that will help um, you guys with some of that. It's a little hard because that's so sort of detached from what you have to probably will ever have to do. But the national board does have maybe one or two questions on, on this topic. So that's why we still teach it. Um, and who knows, you could go to some you know, office that just still has a processor and you need to have a basic understanding of it. So that used to be a bigger deal than it is today, however. Radiation to protect the operator, pretty much all the things that we do to protect the patient protects us as well. But what's, what are you guys doing when the x-ray is happening? You're out of the room, right? So it's not like you're in there. Um, however, if you use a nomad, or um, if you do happen, uh, those of you who are dental assistants may have had this experience where you're like, I'm gonna hold the x-ray, go run and push the button. So you may be in the room, not, a, not uh, recommended at all. Um, if you do happen to be in that situation, just make sure you're the one that pushes the button and not the one that holds the x-ray or have the patient hold the x-ray. They have two hands. If it's a little kid, it might be a little harder but you're out of the room. Now there is, um, there is a, a slide here that shows this, never stand in direct line of essential ray, rather stand at a, a 90 to 35 degree from the, from the central ray. And the, the thought behind that is the scatter will scatter it at a certain, it'll scatter in a certain way. And that will kind of be like a window of safety if you are in the room. And so this image here, we always stand at least six feet away from the primary beam. And you are when you're, when you're out of the room. Um, the drywall is sufficient to absorb the x-ray photons. They're not lead lined walls. There is a little view window that you look through. I don't know if that's leaded glass. I kind of doubt it. Um, I know that things like that, it used to be. I remember when I was in school, they're like, you're standing behind a lead lined wall and this is leaded glass. I don't know if that's necessary anymore because I know that the just the sheetrock absorbs the, the x-ray and that little window. Um, actually, that's why when you're in your room and you have the patient, we say always make sure that the chair is facing the window for one, so you can look at your patient and you can see if they've moved or something. But if your patient is facing that little window, your central ray is never going to be facing out the window. So your central ray is always going to go this way or this way or this way, but it's never going to face come out, out the window. So it doesn't even matter if that window's lead lined or not. I can ask somebody, someone probably knows, but I, I kind of doubt it's lead lined. Um, and then never hold a scent, the film for the patient, never hold or stabilize the tube head. So this is that little kind of window of safety. So I think the, the thought process is as the beam comes in, the scatter radiation will go in such a way that it's not gonna necessarily scatter through the patient and then hit you in this window. I think that's essentially what this, is, this diagram is saying. However, it's kind of a moot point because you're not in the room. You're, you're, and if you have a nomad, you're behind, you're standing behind the nomad, which is really a window of safety because the, the radiation is going to fan out. Okay. So then we have this maximum permissible dose. And this, um, again, you're not going to be, uh, there's not going to be any questions on remembering these actual numbers. Um, so this is more just sort of informational, but, and to me, it kind of confuses it because, so when you think of maximal permissible dose, think of like the absolute biggest dose you could have and still survive. Nowhere near would you want that to be a dose that you got or a patient got on a regular basis. So when it says 50 uh, microsieverts, for the whole body for the year of a radiation worker, that doesn't mean that they should get 50 microsieverts at all. That just means that if they got up to that amount because of some crazy wackadoo thing that happened while they were at work, they'd be okay. Um, and then for the um, general public, addition to your regular walking around what you get in the world, 
um, one microsievert um, additional to the whole body. And if you're pregnant, they say no more than half per month while you're pregnant. All of this kind of, to me, I'm just, I almost don't even like touching on it. It was, it was in the slide deck, so I kept it, but I feel like it kind of throws a little bit of a confusion because you think, well, why would a pregnant woman even want to get half of microsievert every month while she's pregnant? But I think they're just saying, this is like the safety threshold, right? It's not like you're trying to hit that target, um, but that's the safety threshold. And it's probably very, very, very hard to hit that threshold because there is something called a dosimeter, a dosimeter. And I wore one when I was pregnant because I still took x-rays when I was pregnant with my daughter. And I wore one because I was, I, I felt, don't ever do this. Don't ever feel guilty about if you don't want to take x-rays when you're pregnant, don't take x-rays when you're pregnant. I did, and I took x-rays while I was pregnant, but I wore a dosimeter. And I sent it in every month and it never registered anything. I stood behind the wall. I even draped a thing over my, my stomach and, um, and it, never, it never did one thing. I have talked with other faculty members and they kept a dose meter in the drawer in the x-ray room and it never, it never registered. Well, that kind of doesn't surprise me because the, the drawer probably absorbed the radiation. They probably didn't, you know, they probably should have left it on top of the counter. But anyways, my point being is that you are safe. So if you feel like being behind a wall could potentially somehow it bounce out of the room and over the course of your career accumulate to something unhealthy, the answer I think is pretty unequivocally no. But yeah, if you are, you know, when you get to that stage in your life, when you're going to have kids, don't ever feel like you can totally tell your doctor I'm not taking x-rays and they can they're fine they have to be fine with it so don't um learn from my learn from my mistake but it ended up being fine I never had a reading on my dose meter which did make me feel better um so that is the end of that we are going to take a short break what time do you guys go to 2 50 Okay, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and we'll do an activity. So no more lecturing, we'll just do an activity.